So welcome everyone um, to our next installment of our FTC webinar series this year. Um, please remember to silence your microphone. And if you have a question, either use the raise hand feature or you can type something in the Q&A um, chat box. So we'll go ahead and get started for the day. Just to give you some information about the FTC. So the FTC is an annual conference jointly sponsored by the American Statistical Association and the American Society for Quality. Um, two divisions or sections of each of those. So from ASQ, we have uh, representatives from the Chemical and Process Industries Division and the Statistics Division. And ASA is the section on physical and engineering sciences and the section on quality and productivity. The goal of the conference is to engage researchers and practitioners in an open dialogue to uh, more effectively use statistics to improve quality and innovation. Um, for more information, please visit our website, falltechnicalconference.org. Um, and there you will find uh, the dates for our next live and in-person event next year. We will finally be able to visit Park City, Utah. We're planning that conference to be held October the 12th through the 14th. Um, and if you visit out on the website, you will see that our call for papers is now officially posted. So if you're interested in contributing to the conference, please um, submit your abstracts online. The abstract deadline will be the end of February. So please be sure to check that out. So this year, since we were not able to um, have our conference in person, we've been hosting a webinar series with events on Wednesday and Friday afternoons. We're about midway through, um, and we um, today have three winners of the CPID UDIN Award. So we'll get into more details about our speakers today, but please plan to join us um, on Friday of this week, as well as Wednesday and Friday of next week as we wrap up this series. All previous um, webinars, as well as uh, the future ones, will be posted, the videos, if you're not able to attend all of them. So check out the website for those as well. So as I mentioned today, we're honoring uh, the winners of the Jack Uden Prize. The Jack Uden Prize is awarded annually from CPID for the best expository paper appearing in Technometrics. Um, and the criteria there for the winner is quality, organization, and clarity, effectiveness of the exposition, completeness of coverage of the topic, interest and topicality of the material, but also of importance is uh, readability and um, to a wide audience. So I'd like to thank um, CPID and the award committee and everyone that's been involved in organizing the webinars as a whole, including Sarah Burke and um, Mickey Mans Mansandino. Um, so thank you for everyone for their work. Our speakers today, we've got three of the um, authors of the award-winning paper. We have uh, Daniel Eck, Chris Notchheim, and Thomas Albrecht joining us today. So we'll have the pleasure of hearing from all three uh, on the topic of multivariate design of experiments for engineering dimensional analysis. Um, so before I turn it over to the speakers, I would like to just give some brief, brief bios of all three of them. So Daniel, Dr. Daniel Eck is an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Illinois. He received his PhD in statistics from the University of Minnesota. Um, and prior to joining the University of Illinois, he was a postdoc um, with the Department of Biostatistics at Yale University. His teaching and research interests center on regression and predictive analytics, exponential family theory and methods, multivariate analysis, variance reduction, design of experiments, sports statistics, and biology. And he's published several articles and served as a referee of many top journals. Up next, we have uh, Chris Notchheim. Dr. Notchheim is uh, the Frank, L. Don Frank A. Donaldson Chair of Operations Management and Supply Chain and Operations Department of the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. He received his PhD in Operations Research for Minnesota, and prior to joining there as faculty, spent time um, at Los Alamos as well as General Mills. He too has um, interest in statistics, business analytics, and experimental design. 
and he has published over 70 articles and textbooks in these areas. Um, Dr. Notchheim has received numerous rewards and rec recognition for his work. He's a fellow of ASA, four-time recipient of the Brombaugh Award, two-time recipient of the uh, Lloyd S. Nelson Award, and now a three-time recipient of the Jack Uden Prize. And then our third speaker today, Thomas Albrecht, is a principal data scientist at Atlassian, if I pronounce that correctly. He has a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Wisconsin and a master's in statistics from the University of Minnesota. Um, he's worked on several medical device manufacturers, um, product design teams, <coughs> and a technical lead for developing an artificial intelligent plat intelligence platform to perform critical to quality visual inspections on medical devices. His research interests also center on optimal design of experiments um, and artificial intelligence. And he is a two-time recipient of the Jack Uden Prize. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Notchheim to get things started. Okay, I think we're, we're just about ready to, to go. Are we going to go uh, without our without our video? Is is that the plan, or should we? Or maybe it's up there. Never. I can see your video. You're okay, good. great. That's all yep. I wanted to know. All right, here we go. Um, delighted to be here. I think all three of us are delighted to be here, and we're looking forward to to giving this presentation. You've all heard about us. I'm Chris. We've got Dan Eck and Tom Albrecht alongside. And um, we, let's see here. Um, there, I can advance it. OK, and of course, this was joint, joint work with Dennis Cook. I want to make one point that uh, I'll come back to kind of at the end of this presentation, and that is that you know, it's 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 useful to be able to work with scientists and engineers when when doing dimensional analysis, and uh, I think we were very very lucky to get Tom Albrecht to join our team because Tom's not only a not only a mechanical engineer who really knows dimensional analysis and has used it, um, but he 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 did finish his master's degree, get his master's degree in statistics as well. So he knows both of these areas. I was lucky enough to be his sort of supervisor for his master's degree. Anyway, so what are we gonna talk about? Well, we wanna talk about, start just talking about the basic ideas of DA. And we'd like to think that we're presenting these in a kind of a way that that uh, is easy for statisticians to, absorb. Uh, I know when I first got into this, I was pretty lost. Um, and so we'll give you a, a fairly detailed introduction to the basic ideas of dimensional analysis. Then we're going to go on to the, some of the new things in this paper, dimensional analysis for multivariate responses. We're going to have examples galore throughout this presentation. Um, we'll talk about some optimal design techniques. And uh, we're going to kind of, well, we'll give some conclusions, but then at the very end, I want to talk a little bit about how we uh, got involved in dimensional analysis in the first place. There's kind of a fun story to tell about that. So here we go. So let's start with a very, very simple example. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I want to mention that I got this example. I stole this example, if you will, from Tom Albrecht's big brother, Mark Albrecht. Uh, who will creep into this at the at the end of this presentation. So we wish to characterize the effects of velocity and time, x1 and x2, on, on a response variable distance. Now we're ignorant, but an oracle knows that the true relationship is distance is velocity times time. And of course, there'll be some experimental error if we run, run an experiment. So how do we figure out this this relationship. How do we do that? I want to take the statistics approach and I'm going to contrast that with the engineer's approach. So here we go. Statistician's approach. Well, we're going to use DOE. You know, 
we're, we're concerned about, we've got two factors and we've concerned about curvatures and interactions. So let's run a response surface model. Let's run a, our design. Let's run a central composite response surface design. And there's a picture of it. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, so we're going to vary velocity and time. Those are the two factors. And we're going to measure distance. So here's our, our, our regression model for the experiment, the full second order model. Uh, we'll get our data. We'll fit the model. We'll do maybe some subset selection. And we'll find that a whole lot of terms drop out. And we wind up with our prediction model. Y hat is 1.04 times x1 times x2, which is essentially velocity times time. OK, so that, that might be the statistician's approach. Let's take a look at the engineer's approach. OK, so the engineer is going to think more like Isaac Newton and think about the mechanics of the physical systems that are governed by physical laws. And one rule is that a physical equation must be dimensionally homogeneous. So here we're going to have distance as a response. And then, and of course, the dimension of distance is miles. And the predictors, to think of them that way, are going to be velocity and time. But however we put those together, we need to have the dimension of that uh, to be miles. So we have the dimensions of the variables. Uh, of course, distance is in miles. Velocity is miles per hour. And time, we're going to call it in hours. And so one dimensionally uh, homogeneous possibility is d equals some constant times velocity times time. So there is a possible expression that is dimensionally uh, homogeneous. One final simplification, and this is pretty important. We make the, the equation dimensionless. We're going to divide both sides of that equation by VT. So now we have a dimensionless, dimensionless representation. Distance over velocity times time is just a constant. To estimate C, all we need to do is pick a velocity, kind of our x1, pick a time, our x2, and observe, observe the distance. And then we can plug in and compute C. We could replicate that, of course, if we have experimental error, which we probably would. But in the end, that's all we have to do. Now, notice we don't have to vary velocity or time. We just pick a value. and. Uh, we get our we get our estimate of c. So to contrast these approaches, uh, in the statistician's approach, we're going to vary two factors, time and distance. We're going to measure velocity. In the engineer's approach, we're not varying anything. There's just one fixed constant. Of course, there's six model parameters in the statistician's approach. In the engineer's approach, there's just a fixed constant C. Now, I haven't mentioned this, but scalability, and this is really important. For, for statisticians, the model is going to be valid inside the experimental range of the factors, right? We, we're not going to be able to do much in the way of extrapolation outside the range of the, of the, of the factors. However, in the engineer's approach, that the model will scale over any experimental range. OK, finally, explanatory power. We've got a local empirical model for the statistician's approach. And the engineer's approach here revealed a universal law between dv and t for physical systems. So I guess you can see there's some power to the engineer's approach here, if you can do it. Just to summarize the dimensional analysis advantages, we've got dimension reduction. So the number of factors is reduced by the number of measurement dimensions in the variable. So in our example, the number of factors was two, uh, distance and time, right? The number of dimensions is two, length and time. So the resulting number of dimensions is two minus two equals zero. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we have a zero dimensional problem.
Second advantage is scalability. Our statistical models are valid within the ranges of the factors, but the dimensionless models can scale to any size. Powerful advantages. So why is scalability important? Well, here's a kind of a fun example. Again, I stole this from Mark Albrecht. Running experiments on a turbine of this size is obviously impossible. We're not gonna be able to run experiments, but running experiments on a model of this size is easy. So if all the, all the variables are dimensionless, we can simply run the experiments on that little probably 3D printout and then extrapolate to the full scale of the uh, turbine, that guy. Okay, so that's an important advantage. So here's an even more compelling type of extrapolation one can do. On the evening of August 5th, 2012 Pacific Daylight Time, NASA's Mars rover, named Curiosity, entered Mars' atmosphere at 20,000 kilometers per hour. Drag slowed it down to around 1,600 kilometers per hour, at which point a parachute opened. This parachute slowed the rover more to about 320 kilometers per hour, or 90 meters per second. Finally, after rockets decelerated it completely, the rover was lowered to the surface of Mars. Every step of this dance was carefully choreographed and rehearsed in many experiments here on Earth. But how could NASA engineers be sure that their designs would work on a totally different planet? The answer is a problem-solving method called dimensional analysis. Okay, so what we'd like to do now is take the Mars Rover DA process um, and, and work it through and see how this exactly works. So <clears throat> we begin with a model. Of course, we're gonna get this from physicists uh, that the velocity at, 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 at which the rover touches down is gonna be a function of four factors. Uh, so we got D is the diameter of the parachute, M is the mass of the rover, G is the gravitational constant, and rho is the density of the atmosphere. Obviously, we're going to need a, a, a subject matter expert, a physicist or an engineer, tell us what the response is and what those, what those predictors are. But in this case, we basically have our four predictors. So over on the right side of the panel, we see the dimensions of each of the variables in that equation. So we got velocity is length over time. The diameter of the parachute is length and so on. The mass of the rover is, is mass. Uh, the dimension of the gravitational constant is length over time squared. And the dimension of the density of the atmosphere is mass over length cubed. So now what we want to do is derive the DA model for this problem. And I want to take you through a very simple process for doing this. So we're going to use Ipsen's 1960 stepwise derivation of the DA model. I have to tell you, when I started working in this, I this this just seemed a bit of a mystery to me until I stumbled onto this particular approach, which we uh, kind of went through in the paper. Makes it really simple. We statisticians understand stepwise processes, right? And uh, so this was pretty straightforward. So at each step one variable is used to eliminate a dimension, for example, mass, length, or time from the set of variables. And the variable used then is eliminated. When we're done, we've got a reduced set of dimensionless variables. So let's do this for the, for the Mars rover process. So we initialize the variables by specifying the dimension. So this is just a repeat of an earlier slide we have. Velocity is the response variable and the length and the dimension is length over time and so on. We've got diameter of the parachute. We've got the mass of the rover, we've got the, the, the gravitational constant and the atmospheric density 
and their dimensions. Okay, that's step zero. Okay, now in step one, we're gonna eliminate a dimension. So we can pick any one of the predictor variables, dmg or rho, and say, we wanna eliminate that dimension. So we're gonna start by taking, looks like my point, oh, there's my point here. We've got the diameter, which is length. Let's eliminate length from all these variables. So we can start by, first of all, and we're gonna, when we're through with this process, this variable will be gone. So I'm gonna put a horizontal line over here. Let's take a look at velocity, it's LT inverse. So if we divide velocity by D, we get VD inverse, we'll have a dimension T inverse. No length involved in the mass. Uh, for the gravitational constant, we've got length times over time squared. So again, we can divide by D to get rid of length. So now we have GD inverse and its, its dimension is now T to the minus two. Finally, rho, that's got ML to the minus three. So if we multiply that by D cubed and we get rho D cubed, we'll have a mass of M. So now we've eliminated one variable and we've got four left. So we'll go to step two. All right, let's take a look at where we are at the end of step one. And we could certainly eliminate mass from this easily using the mass of the rover. So we'll put a horizontal line here because we're gonna eliminate this variable. We've got uh, the only variable mass is involved in now is rho d cubed here. So we just divide uh, by m to get rid of that one. And now that's a dimensionless variable. Okay, we're almost done. As you can tell, we're down to simply time. We need to eliminate that. Okay, so let's go to the next step. We're gonna use, uh, we're gonna eliminate time using GD inverse. Um, so what we need to do uh, is, uh, is divide this guy by the square root of dg inverse to eliminate time in this response. And that's what we do. A little simplification results in v over the square root of dg, and that's dimensionless. And we've arrived at the solution. We have one dimensionless response and one dimensionless predictor. So the result is our DA model v over the square root of dg is some function we have to determine of rho d cubed over m. Of course, these guys are named, are called pi groups. So in the parlance of the sort of pi technology, pi, using pi's, we have pi naught as the response is some function phi of pi one. Okay, so now we've done our dimension reduction, we've gone, um, uh, what do we start with? Well, we've gone from four predictors down to one. And uh, so now we can run our experiment. We're gonna try to vary pi one, and then we're gonna, we're gonna record pi naught. So, oh, and by the way, here's a little summary uh, of our <clears throat> derivation of the DA model. So here we are back to what I just said. We have a one factor DA experiment and we're going to vary pi one. Now, if you look at pi one, it's rho d cubed over m. Rho is the density of the atmosphere. That's, that's impossible for us to vary. M is the mass of the rover. We don't wanna build a lot of different rovers. So that's something we don't wanna vary. But in order to vary pi one, we can just vary d. D is the, dis, d is the diameter of the parachute. So all we need to do is vary that, vary D, and we can just build some different parachutes with different diameters, uh, <clears throat> run the experiment and measure pi one. So that's what we did. I should say that's what they did. And <clears throat> here is the results, here are the results of the experiment. So what we've plotted, uh, we took the logs to make this a little prettier. We have the log of, pi one here and the log of pi naught over here. And uh, we have this 
<clears throat> relationship. All right. So those are the those are the pi groups that we observed on Earth. And that's the result of the experiment that we conducted on Earth, I should say. Well, what about Mars? Well, the amazing thing about this is we can just change the gravitational constant and the atmospheric density to the to the values that apply on Mars and just recompute the pi groups, which we did. And so here are the responses uh, that we get on planet Mars. Okay. Now we're trying to determine what velocity I'm sorry, let's go to the next slide here. Uh, we're trying to determine uh, the diameter of the parachute that's gonna slow us to uh, 90 meters per second. That was the goal in the video. And so all we've done is we solved for V and we get pi naught times square root of DG. And we so kind of recomputed the results and we did a smooth and then we did a back solve so we want to get the velocity down to 90 meters per second we need a parachute with a diameter of 101 meters and that's basically what was done in the video so the example shows the power of da not only can we extrapolate outside the range of the experimental region we can we can understand the effects of changing physical constants without actually changing them. And the example here was you run the experiment on Earth and you extrapolate to Mars. So I hope I've convinced you of the power of this method. How do we know this works? Well, we're going to turn this, I'm going to turn this over to Dan at this point. So I will stop my sharing and turn it over to Dan to talk about how we know this works. I think you're muted, Dan. Okay, so thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, thank you for passing it over here. So yeah, we'll investigate how do we know that this process works. And one of the early uh, results um, that justifies DA is this Buckingham Pi theorem that came out in the early 1900s. And so this theorem, uh, ca the casual um, interpretation of this theorem is that if there is a physically meaningful equation involving say n physical variables, then the original equation can be rewritten in terms of p dimensionless parameters constructed from the original variables where k is the number of physical dimensions involved. And you can see if you go back and look at the Epson procedure that Chris was explaining below, that's just kind of um, this held under the hood. And once this you knew that this held, you could go to work on that Epson procedure. And you can see that in that case, there was um, a certain number of variables, certain number of, di um, of dimensions, and we got the, the dimension reduction as, as given by this theorem. OK, so in the current paper, what we did was we extended this Buckingham theorem to cases or um, functional forms where there's more than one response. We've um, considered some multivariate design criteria within this framework and provided, as Chris alluded to, a whole bunch of um, examples to explain uh, how this theorem works and why the additional conditions are, uh, that arise from multi-response um, designs are, are necessary. Um, we provided some recommendations for optimal design algorithms in complicated situations and provided recommendations for what to do when the conditions of the theorem no longer held. So there are some cases where uh, the multivariate Buckingham pi theorem won't work. But if you couldn't, for example, make some of the responses as a, um, you couldn't perform the Epson procedure to remove the physical dimensions of some of the responses, you could be able to use some of the other responses. Um, we don't provide too many examples in that direction, but it's an extension of this theorem to a case that may be um, relevant. And we, we would like to think that we provided a better uh, introduction to DA for statisticians. And I think that a uh, Mars rover example is pretty uh, compelling. Okay, so this is um, 
Well, well it's not as complicated as it looks. So um, we'll go through and explain just the brief details of this theorem. And you can see, if you think back to the examples that Chris alluded to, you can see where this is just kind of an articulation of, of needing to have like a physical meaningful equation. So first we'll just start and say that we have this relationship with R responses and P predict P predictors. Um, and the relationship between the predictors and the responses is given by this unknown function. Um, the quantities, the responses and the predictors involve K fundamental dimensions. And we assume here that the dimension matrix for the response belongs to the span of the dimension matrix for the predictors. And this is what allows for this Ipsen procedure to work in the multivariate setting, uh, canceling out the dimensions on the response side as well as on the predictor side. And we also, I mean, and then condition three here is that, that we can write every one of these variables in this, uh, this power law combination of the dimensions under study. This just sort of lays out the groundwork for the, um, um, the Ibsen procedure that Chris mentioned earlier. So with these conditions and this idea of this physically meaningful functional form that we can write, um, then we can rewrite our formula of interest, which is the response as a function of predictors, as this, this new functional relationship where this pi tilde is a vector of R dimensionless responses, and we have um, P minus rank of B dimensionless predictors. So um, we get this dimension reduction on the predictor side, as well as a new functional form involving just dimensionless quantities. Okay, so we'll provide a simple example uh, taken from Frank White's Fluid Mechanics book in 2008. In his book, he didn't he didn't really consider a joint analysis between uh, two variables, but we just um, considered a, a uh, bivariate um, form to fit it within this optimal design framework that we're building for uh, multiple responses. So here, uh, uh, Frank White is considering a pump, a pump design with two outputs, head pressure and brake horsepower. And there's six predictors um, that are that are thought to belong to this functional form between predictors and responses. Um, however, we're gonna consider a case where this pump will be specifically designed for one type of liquid. And so some of these parameters will not be considered and some will not be varied. So here we have this uh, table on the lower left-hand side that lists the variables under consideration where we have our outputs, which are head pressure and brake horsepower, and then we also have predictors of Q, which is discharge, D, which is impeller di diameter, N, which is shaft speed, rho, which is fluid density, mu, which is viscosity, and epsilon, which is surface roughness. And in this experiment, we'll consider one particular variable, or sorry, one particular liquid. So fluid density and viscosity will not be varied, and surface roughness, we won't, uh, we'll, we'll uh, assume it's held constant. Okay, and we can now construct our dimensional matrices, where if we look at the A, the first column lists the uh, dimensions for um, head pressure, and the second column lists the dimensions for brake horsepower. And if we just do a simple check, we can see that A belongs to the span of B in this case. So the Buckingham theorem will um, apply if we believe the functional relationship from these predictors to these two responses. Okay, and so in this case, um, post Epson procedure or just working it out, um, we can come up with a DA model where we have two predictors, two dimensionless predictors and two dimensionless responses. So in this case, only the uh, discharge and pillar diameter and shift speed, shaft speed are varied and the parameters related to liquids are going to be held as constant. And now we can start considering a design space for how to run um, optimal designs regarding this new functional relationship on regarding uh, dimensionless quantities. So from, from Frank White's book, we can get a range um, for each one of these variables, which we want to vary to find this optimal pump design. 
and we can consider a design space for the dimensionless parameters uh, below, which is just you know uh, um, a function of the uh, the original uh, variables on their original scales. However, the region is a little bit different. So on the original scale, it's just a just a box that we're considering as the 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 potential design points. But here it's this highly nonlinear. Uh, um, hard to work with pi space, which we have simplified and you know projected it down to this negative one, negative one um, plane, um, and we can see that this space is not as easy to work with. Um, but it is still a dimension reduction, and and provided that algorithms, which we provide in the paper, are used, we can work on this particular space, and we can get optimal designs run with fewer number of variables. And of course, the experiment is uh, uh, scalable. So in the previous paper, a plethora of designs was recommended, the previous paper being um, Cook and uh, uh, the previous dimensional analysis paper. Um, a plethora of designs was recommended. Um, note that in the parametric case, when they consider de-optimal designs, they consider it for third order or higher models. So if we just go back, if we imagine considering, considering variables on, if we started, if we started our, our thinking with uh, simple relationships between predictors and responses without this dimensional analysis transformation, then we may consider, you know, first order, second order models. Well, here, after doing these kind of reconfigurations, we may think that the relationship is just a little bit. Um, more uh, uh, just a higher order model might be uh, more appropriate in this case. So that's the basis for this recommendation. Um, and one of the benefits of, um, of, of some of the recommendations in both of these design papers is this idea of a robust design in which if you're not entirely sure of the functional relationship after doing dimensional analysis, even if you've extended to third or fourth or higher order polynomials, you can still consider the design on the, the design that you would have considered before doing dimensional analysis and consider, I want say 80% of the optimal like efficiency on that design space um, as, a, as a minimum guarantee. At, and so you can run that type of design as well. Okay, so in the present work, the design criteria that we consider is this multivariate I optimality. And basically what it is, is it's just a, a weighted average of the I optimality designs for each one of these responses where the weights are chosen by the uh, inverse um, variances um, of the design itself. And there's this nice connection between this design and the model robust L optimality criterion of Cook and Knotson from 82. And again, the weights are given by the inverse um, variances. So we can consider our, our original problem, which we are going to reduce down or use dimensional analysis uh, for to reduce the number of uh, predictors and obtain dimensionless quantities. We have our design space to optimize over. We have a multivariate criterion that we're considering, and we can arise at an I-optimal design with 16 runs, which uh, performs pretty well in this uh, case. So this is um, how we know the procedure works with this multivariate dimensional analysis. We have recommendations for um, what to do in cases that fall outside of it. And we articulate why the conditions are necessary in the paper. But this example is still uh, a toy example. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom to give a, uh, a real example on uh, this procedure. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Start my presentation here. Give me just one moment. Apologies. All right. Let's, uh... no. Apologies for the technical difficulty here. Sorry, folks. Okay. Okay, 
So we talked about a couple of toy examples so far, but what do these problems really look like in an engineering world? Well, I'd like to consider- It's on another this. screen. Oh, Sorry. it is. <laughs> oh. I see. Thank you. All right, that should be better now. There you go. Okay, great. So uh, I'd like to sort of consider designing this in a, in a real world scenario. You know, what do engineers really deal with uh, day to day? And so we're gonna talk about designing efficient heat exchangers. So this is a picture of a pretty large heat exchanger. You can see like an eight and a half, 11 sheet of paper there on the top. And really what a heat exchanger is, is it's a big bundle of tubes that you put into some process you wanna keep cool generally. Uh, so say you've got a chemical reaction and you need to keep it at the right temperature and it generates a bunch of waste heat. You immerse this vessel in that reaction and then you push a bunch of coolant through each of these little tubes you can see. And by doing that, you can keep it at the right temperature. So why is this a multivariate response problem, right? It sounds like we're just talking about heat transfer. Well, we're engineers and we're honestly, honestly uh, constrained most often by cost and efficiency, right? We can do just about anything we want, but doing it efficiently and doing it at low cost is where it becomes challenging. So we want to both maximize the amount of heat extracted and reduce the amount of power required to run this thing so we can do it effectively and efficiently. So as an engineer, I always like to start with the schematic and sort of the physical system first before diving into the math that helps kind of understand what variables we should be thinking about as we design these systems. And so this is a schematic of one of those individual tubes in that heat exchanger and there are a couple hundred in there. And if we look at this and we try to figure out what variables are going to impact how well this works as a heat exchanger, we've got a couple here. We have the pipe wall temperature, the hotter that tube is, the more heat we're going to extract the diameter and the length of the pipe, and that influences the surface area of the pipe. The more surface area, obviously, the more heat we're gonna extract. Uh, and then finally, we've got fluid velocity. How fast we push the coolant through that system is gonna both increase, the, the faster we push it through, the more heat we extract, but also the faster we push it through, the more energy we lose and the more power we need to invest in the process. We kind of have competing objectives here. We also have to think about the stuff we're gonna push through these tubes, the coolant. It's got a number of properties as well. The viscosity, uh, how fast, you know, how sticky that substance is, its resistance to flow. We probably don't want to use maple syrup, for example. That's going to be tough to push through those tubes. Uh, we'd have to consider the density of that fluid too, right? Um, the more dense it is, the more energy we usually have to put into it to get it moving, to get it moving faster. Uh, we have to consider the thermal conductivity, right? Air might be nice to push through a system because it's really low density, low viscosity, but its thermal conductivity isn't super great, so it's not going to cool it down very well. Water would do a much better job as anybody who's jumped into a lake when it's cold would know. Um, you know, we've got uh, to consider thermal conductivity as well for that. And then finally, the input temperature, that fluid. The lower it is, generally the more heat we're going to pull out of this system. So we have a more complex system here. And this is you know, real world constraints. This is a pretty typical design for a heat exchanger like this. Uh, so we've got a bivariate response. Um, one of the responses is heat transfer rate. That's really what we were originally setting out to do. And then we kind of have the second one we imposed on ourselves saying, this isn't worth doing unless we can do it cost effectively. So we need to reduce the power loss in the system. And we're gonna characterize that through pressure loss, right? The fluid pressure I lose moving through that system has to be put back into that fluid as it loops around to the head again, right? And when I have a pump there or something like that, that's increasing the fluid pressure to drive it through the system. So that's energy loss. So we really have nine independent variables, which we'll talk about in the next slide, where four fundamental dimensions, length, mass, temperature, and time. And by the Buckingham Pi theorem, we would expect we're gonna have nine minus four equals five independent pi groups after we're done with this procedure. So let's take a look at the variables in depth. So here's kind of a chart of everything, and I'm not going to go through each one of these. We've got quite a few here, uh, but we've got the variable, the standard international units, and then the fundamental dimension, right? Mass, length, time, and how it's represented there. Now, folks that have really been paying attention will probably note that I talked about eight different variables when we were constructing the system, but I have nine input variables listed here. And the interloper here is acceleration due to gravity. And this is actually pretty common. We're not expecting to build this heat exchanger on Mars or move it to the moon or put it on the space station, right? So it's not really gonna change during our experiment. But we often find when we do dimensional analysis, we have to include constants like this, both to be able to construct pi groups and also to make sure we're representing the physical system appropriately. So we kind of lost one dimension we might reduce. Um, the way you can think of these is, you know, 
there are variables that are constants, but they might affect the system and affect the overall relationship. In this case, we need acceleration due to gravity because we might be pushing this fluid up a hill. If you think of a water tower, right, the way we increase the pressure of water is you pump it way up to the top and that creates a pressure gradient. So as you pump up that height, you're losing pressure as you go. So we need to include some constants like that. And generally, you're gonna to wanna to speak to a domain expert, an engineer, or consult like a physics textbook to figure this out and make sure you've got all these factors considered before you go through the dimensional analysis process. So with that as our setting, we can now derive the multivariate DA model as follows. Uh, this is following the exact same procedure. We have a lot more variables here, but it's actually not really more complicated. A couple of things we wanna pay attention to is we want both of our response variables to end up in different pi groups here. Uh, and then beyond that, we're just going to go through and eliminate variables using that same procedure. Uh, in step one, we remove mass and we choose density to do that. So you can see we've canceled one dimension out here. In step two, we're going to remove length as a fundamental quantity using the diameter of the pipe. In step three, we're going to move, remove time using velocity divided by diameter. So sometimes you'll have to use a combined group to eliminate other variables, right, as we saw in the Mars rover example. And then finally, in step four, we're removing temperature using the temperature of the fluid. And now at the end of it, we've got every remaining pi group has no dimensional, has no dimensionality at all. They're dimensionless groups. And we have this final system we can see at the bottom here. We have five predictor variables, predictor pi groups, and two pi responses. The cool thing about this too is as an engineer and as you go through these systems, a lot of these pi groups show up time and time again in different systems. Uh, and they generally, it's not necessarily just sort of a trick of how the math works out. They generally have kind of interpretable meanings too. Reynolds number shows up in a ton of fluid mechanics um, and thermodynamics equations. And it's really, a lot of these are the ratio between two competing forces. In Reynolds number, you have the viscous force here represented by viscosity divided by the inertial force, which is kind of how much inertia it has built up in the velocity and density of the fluid. Euler's number similarly, has the essentially pressure energy divided by the inertial energy uh, of the system. And so you kind of have these ratios. And the cool thing about those is engineers build up this intuition over time after working with these numbers again and again and again to interpret their meaning. Reynolds number in particular has a meaning of uh, beyond a certain number. And I, if I recall correctly, it's 2,400. Fluid flow is transfer from being sort of neat and orderly, where it's like a streamline, uh, just a nice orderly flow through a pipe to really turbulent. You start to see vortices and you start to see things like that. So the flow dynamics change pretty dramatically at certain points, and that's going to hold from system to system to system. So you tend to generate this understanding over time based on these groups. So we have our pi groups and our functional form, and now we need to generate some designs. So we can go about this in either a parametric or non-parametric way. Parametrically, we can generate designs, uh, and the way we found to best do it to accommodate sort of that robust process that Dan talked about, where you still want to have a backup maybe in the original variable space, is to use a coordinate exchange algorithm in the original space of those original nine variables, eight for us because we're not varying gravity, and use coordinate exchange and then calculate our objective functions in pi space. And the interesting little caveat we had to add here is because we generally, for traditional coordinate exchange, would use a grid, you know, they're nice and neatly uniformly spaced. When you translate that grid to pi space, it gets all warped and you might have some gaps and spots you really don't want. So what we did is we actually used a continuous optimizer along each coordinate instead of using a grid search. And by doing that, we were able to sort of avoid some of those bigger gaps that show up in the grid if you translate it to this pi space. Another way to go about it would be to use a non-parametric design. Uh, the one we used in the paper and recommended was fast, flexible filling. For this, we generate a candidate design of 100,000 uniformly distributed points in the pi space to use the candidate set. And then we applied the fast flexible filling algorithm to create the design from there. And here's what some of those designs look like. This is the parametric design. Uh, and this is for a third order polynomial approximation and it's using the I optimality criterion. So we can see that we get a pretty good distribution of points even though we're doing our search in the untransformed original variable space. It worked out pretty well and that allows us to estimate, you know, calculate the goodness of models in both the original space and the pi space. And for our non-parametric design, you know, we have a pretty good distribution here as well. This was done directly in the pi space, so no big surprises here, right? We've got a nice distribution of points throughout the space. So that's really a multivariate dimensional analysis in a nutshell. Um, we've really found here 
through doing this that DA is a very powerful tool for modeling physical systems. It allows us to build models with parsimony because of the reduction in turns, dimension reduction, obviously, and then most importantly, from an engineering standpoint, scalability, where we can scale from small, easy to experiment on systems up to very difficult systems or impossible systems in the Mars example. Uh, we found that multivariate responses really aren't uncommon because most engineering problems are constrained not only by performance, but also by efficiency. And they're often governed, both of those outputs are governed by the same variables. So a multivariate model really is a good fit. Uh, we've gave generalizations of the Buckingham Pi theorem for multivariate responses, um, gave a new criterion to evaluate those multivariate, multivariate parametric models, and finally gave some recommendations for design construction on how you might go about constructing models for these new multivariate dimensional analysis equations. So as we close here, I'd like to transfer it back to Chris, who's going to kind of talk about how we as statisticians got involved in this DA stuff in the first place. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Let's let's go to the next slide and I'll kind of walk. This I like, you know, we all like stories and this is I, I like this story because for one thing, I get to say something about what an idiot I was early in my career. I was working at Los Alamos and doing some cons statistical consulting. I was in the statistical sciences group. Anyway, a scientist came in to talk to me about a designed experiment. And he basically gave me a response pie group and maybe one or two, I can't recall, of the uh, sort of predictor pie groups and said, I want to run an experiment on these pie groups. So of course I did what, what any good statistician would do. I lectured my client on the fact that when he's got the basic control variables tied together into a pie group, we can't learn the individual effects of those individual factors. And so his idea was really dumb <laughs> and he should break these apart and, you know, take the statistician's approach. Uh, and he actually took my advice, which was unfortunate and, um, you know, ran a, ran a kind of a standard experiment. So anyway, I left Los Alamos later. I was at the Carlson School and I gave a talk about design of experiments. And one of my colleagues from my department had a master, had a, I think he had a master's degree in mechanical engineering. He came into my office after my talk and he said, why aren't you talking, why aren't you using pie groups for this? And, you know, suddenly my mind flashed back to Los Alamos. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I'll get you a chapter. So he copied me a chapter on, uh, from, it may have been uh, uh, Frank White's book on dimensional analysis. And he gave it to me and he said, here, read this. And I read it and of course it was way too complicated for me. So I just sort of forgot about the whole problem. But here's kind of where the breakthrough came. Um, Tom's brother, Mark and I, Mark was finishing his his master's degree at Minnesota. And we were looking around for uh, a problem to work on. And Tom was working at Boston Scientific and he had just run an experiment. Um, you were doing weld, some kind of welding, right, Tom? It was, uh, yeah, it was a laser welding process. Laser, laser welding. Pointing polymers. And he had run a response surface experiment on these variables and fit the model and he did pretty well. But then he noticed he could combine the variables into some pie groups. And he did that and he refit the model and he got a much better fit with a simpler model. And so Tom called his brother, Mark, who was of course working on his mass, finishing his master's degree and say, hey, I got this weird result. <laughs> I, get, I get a, you know, I did this little thing and I got a better fit. And um, Mark told me about it and we both agreed, okay, well, we better go talk to Tom. So we went over to Boston Scientific and we found out what went on. And all of a sudden I remembered this stuff about pie groups. And I said, maybe we should have been designing these experiments for pie groups. And so Mark took over at that point, did a literature search on design of experiments for dimensional analysis and found nothing, which just told us at that point that 
you know, the bottom line was statisticians weren't talking to engineers, just like I wasn't back in 1980. We were lecturing, I think. <laughs> and so then that got us interested in the problem. Then, uh, so we published the paper in, uh, in 2013. That was the first paper on experimental design for engineering dimensional analysis. And I'll, I'll shamefully mention that that did win a, uh, a Uden Prize uh, back in 2013. And then Dennis Cook and I were giving a PhD seminar on design and I introduced design for DA. And Dan Eck was a student and he looked at that and he said he was very interested in multivariate responses, part of his work. He said, I wanna, I wanna see if I can extend this multivariate, to, to extend the pi, the Buckingham pi theorem, theorem to the multivariate case, which he did. And of course that led to our paper in, in 2021. The only other, the uh, Dennis Lynn and some of his colleagues have made, made some nice contributions. Before we published the 2013 paper, I sent a preprint to, to Dennis Lynn and he got very invited, interested and invited me to Penn State to give a talk and I did. And he immediately got his students working on it. So there've been some nice contributions coming out of Penn State. So that's the history. I just wanna, I just wanna emphasize again, communication between, <laughs> between statisticians and engineers, so important and so important having an engineer on the team. I think that brings us to the last slide, Tom, and which basically says, uh, thank you. And I think we can open it up for questions at this point. I hope there are. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen, for a wonderful presentation and paper. Um, we did have a question. Um, Dan has already addressed it in directly to the uh, person that asked it, but I'll restate it in case there's others on the line that are interested. Um, so the question was, after you get the dimensionless pi groups, how do you decide which error structure to assume? Is there any theory or do you just go plus epsilon and see how it works out? Do you assume different responses have uncorrelated errors? Right, so what I said with that to that was um, we, we are assuming plus epsilon are working with plus epsilon and then we um we are also working in the setting that the dimensionless responses are uncorrelated and we provide a rationale for that in uh, section four of uh the paper but the the main idea is that if you've captured all of the uh dependence in the system then then we we think that we can make the leap to uncorrelated responses Eric. So that's the bottom line, I think, right? If we have the right model, we, do, we don't need to worry about it. If there are other, any, any other questions on the line, please feel free to um, type in the Q&A section at the bottom and we can address them. We do have a few minutes left. I guess I, I have a question. I've, I've seen you present on this a couple of times and it's always really interesting to me. Um, a lot of the examples that you show are more around um, designing new systems. So designing a new pump, designing the rover, things of that nature. Do you see any applicability to using this in an industrial setting where we're maybe scaling up processes? So maybe the equipment is already existing, but we need to better understand what our manufacturing conditions should be at the different scales. Yeah, I can maybe take that question. That was actually the original impetus behind that 2011 conversation that Chris mentioned. We were looking to scale up and optimize the efficiency of our laser weld processes. We've been doing this for years and years at Boston Scientific at the time, and we even had systems in production. We just wanted to better understand how they were going to translate to a slightly different product. And we found that even in that situation, the, the DA model the dimensionless model did much better in um, its ability to predict the correct response than you know the standard model that uses all terms separately. So yeah, I, I think there is a lot of applicability to even when you understand the system well, it can still be a better representation. Okay. Thank you. Um, we do have another question. Um, in the heat exchanger example, how many runs for each of the design types? Also, how is multicollinearity dealt with in the analysis? So for the heat exchanger design, we used 100 uh, individual 
100 runs for each analysis. Um, and we didn't actually execute on that design. It was more to demonstrate the uh, fitness of designs that could be created. I don't know, uh, Dan, if you have any comments on multicollinearity um, on your end. Um, no, I don't. Let's see. There will be, I mean, let me just comment. I mean, there, there will be, there, there will be correlations as a function of the, des, the shape of the design region. It, it's, you, you, you can't, right. you can't really avoid that. I think it's maybe less of a concern if we're using non-parametric sorts of models to, to, to identify the function. And then I think the next one is more of a, a comment than a question. It's um, Greg Peoples said it's better fits in pi groups can be from spurious correlation. I guess that's a comment. Do you agree, disagree? So I'm not, I, I think I just need a little clarification on the question. Oh, and by the way, hi, Greg. <laughs> 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 um, we've talked about this before, um, but I'm just trying to remember the, the spurious correlation. In what sense do we have spurious correlation? I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand. Yeah, I don't know if it would be helpful. I can give Greg permission to talk. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Let me see. So Greg, I think I just gave you permission to talk if you'd like to. Clarify. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, so uh, it's because you've got predictor variables on both sides of the equation oh, that, yeah. uh, and and there's been some work that's done that you can quantify how much of the goodness of fit is due to spurious correlation and how much is due to real correlation or real relationship. Okay, and I'm just going to say, Greg, and, and you and I have talked about this before. Uh, you, you know more about that than I do, and I, I, uh, I, I don't have a good answer to that. But what you're saying is that you will get models. That, I, I guess you're saying coming from the analysis, you may get models that look a little bit better in terms of R square and so forth than they really should. Is that kind of what you're getting at because of the spurious correlation? Because yeah, we, yeah, because you're right. You've got you've got. But I guess it depends to some degree on what you're varying, right? Because that pi group on the on the left side, I'm sorry, on the right side, um, you, you 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 could be varying all of the elements in it simultaneously, or you might, like we did in the Mars example, just pick one of them. I guess it's going to depend on what you, how you're varying those things. Am I right? Uh, it it can I. A lot of my experience came from one big problem working with uh, chemical engineers who came up with multiple pi groups. And so they fit models that way. I used a modification of the dimensional analysis and the models I came up with had real correlation so much better than theirs because of spurious correlation that we used my modified approach rather than the traditional dimensional analysis approach because of spurious correlation. Okay, have you published that? Uh, only in a technical report. Ah, okay. Well, if you could share your technical report, I don't know if you can, but if you could, that'd be, uh, I'd love to see it. Yes. One of the other things, we generally would do um, from an engineering standpoint is evaluate the fitness of our resultant models. So that's one of the reasons for that robust approach too, to say, look, we're gonna build a model that fits in the original space as well. We're gonna sort of evaluate both criteria. Uh, and then when it finally goes to sort of assess models to figure out which one we ultimately want to use, we would likely do an evaluation in the original response space, even though you know that might change your error structure a bit, but if you're looking at say overall error against predictions, we would likely evaluate that from an engineering perspective in the original variable space to say, okay, you know, we probably do have some of those effects uh, as you mentioned, Greg, but we'll ultimately after fitting, 
to choose which model to ultimately use, we would likely go to the original response space to compare all candidate models, regardless of the pi space or the original space they come from. Okay, good. Yeah, and you can do that with this. We didn't really spend a lot of time on it, but uh, Dan kind of introduced it, but you can do that with this robust design approach. The idea is to get get good designs both in the original chi space and a, and a good design in the chi sub pi space so that you can when you're done you can do, you can you can look at it from either perspective mm -hmm. yeah All right, well, uh, that's all the questions that we have and we are a few minutes over our time. So I like uh, just again to congratulate our speakers on their award and thank you for sharing with us today. Uh, please join us again on Friday afternoon um, when we will have um, John Stalrich uh, present uh, for the SPES award. So thank you and have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thanks for having Bye -bye. us. Thank you. Yeah.